Welcome to Wine Conf Assembly of God, our online church. We're so glad you've joined us today. You know, God has something special for you. I know I say that a lot, but I believe it every time we meet together, God has something special just for you. We've been praying for you. We've been praying that you'll not only come online, but also come to church or, or God will just impart inside of you just an incredible, incredible miracle that you need to have take place today. Later on, Pastor Becky is going to be preaching and sharing the word. But I believe even during the worship time, God wants to move in your life. There's some things he wants to do. He wants to change you. He wants to rearrange you. There are other things he wants to do inside of you. Part of worship is our giving unto the Lord, and we, we give of our, our tithe and our offering. And uh, you can do that on Tithely or send in a check, uh, mail it into us. The address comes up there throughout the thing. And uh, we'd be glad to assist you with that. And we also believe that God not only wants to minister in your finances, and I believe that people that, that give that first fruit, God just begins to turn things around in their lives. I've watched it happen so many times. Even in my own life, I've watched it happen. But it's part of our worship also, our worship unto God, as we glorify and magnify His name. And I just want to pray for you today. Lord, I ask that you just minister to those watching online today, around the world, even locally, Lord, whoever they are. We ask, God, that you'll be with them in a special way. God, meet their needs. There's some things going on there family-wise. There's also some things going on there financially in their lives. And Lord, we ask that you will do a miracle in their lives today. And I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now join us in worshiping our living God, Almighty God. He is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And let's worship Him. Amen. How many of you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God this morning? Amen. Let's celebrate that. I'm not a 
hello here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. Never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. The baby pain in the night, the joy comes in the morning. And when the ocean breaks, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Oh, your love never fails. You make all things. You make all things work together for my good. You believe it this morning. You make all things work. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay the same. another person sometimes, but he never changes. Amen. He never changes. You might be going through a bad season, but he's still the same Amen. yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? He makes all things work together for your good. He makes all things work together for my good. You make all things Your love never 
worship and praise him because he is worthy. He is worthy. And all we have now to give is our praise to him, our worship to him because he's worth it. And then we live our lives that will reflect him here, his presence here on earth. So that is why we worship and we worship exuberantly. We worship and lift our hands. We worship and clap. We worship and cry because we know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords he is holy. He is the Lord God Almighty and He is worthy of it all. Worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 Worthy of it all. Yes, you are just so worthy of it all. Yes, you are all my praise. You deserve it all. Yes, you are worthy of it all. Just so worthy of it all. Well, you are all things. You, you are all things. You deserve the glory. Day and night, night and day. Day and night, night and day, they do say. Rise. Day and night. Night and day, 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 night and You are all things. You are all things. You deserve the glory. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things. Because you are worthy. We worship you because you're the one who sits on the throne. We worship you because of who you are. You are El Shaddai. You are Elohim. You are Yahweh. You are the Lamb of glory. We worship you because of who you are. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And Lord, we thank you for being who you are. Because without you being who you are, we would be nothing. We would not even be here. But it is because of who you are that we are here. And we worship you. Because of who you are. And we don't want anyone else to do it for us. We don't want creation to do it for us. We don't want the rocks and the trees to do it for us. We want to lift our voice to you. Because of who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My Jesus, 
in your peace and not wrestle with the things they don't have control over, but to just let them go and know that you are taking care of it. And Lord, when you take care of it, it is the best care. The best care. Because it's it's not muddled by human thought. It's not muddled by, by human perspective. It's not muddled by the hands of, of our humanness that when we try to fix things, it's pure. It's the best. And there's nothing like it when you take care of it all. So I thank you, you would increase their capacity to trust you and believe you for more of what you want to do. Because Lord, your word says that you are able. You are able to do. You are able to do exceedingly you are able to do exceedingly abundant. You are able to do exceedingly abundant above all we can ever ask or think according to your power that is at work in us. So I thank you for your promise that you're doing exceedingly abundant. And help us to even ask and think for more exceedingly abundant things. Because you have a lot more exceedingly abundant you want to pour out over us. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about Nehemiah and some things that were going on. We're specifically going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. You know, Nehemiah has many insights on how to rebuild, restore, overcome, and rejoice. And I find that a lot of times we, you know, there's that scripture in Nehemiah, um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And and we just think that, well, that should be joy, but how do I get strength out of joy? And, and we're not really going to go into that today, but I often find that as Christians, we just don't have, I feel, the joy that we should have. And, and you know, we look, um, we look sadder than anyone else, like almost on the planet. Uh, planet. And, and it just doesn't make sense that we should not be joyful because we have... Uh, the God of, who created the universe living in us. So we should be joyful. We should have joy. And we need to kind of check sometimes our countenance to kind of make sure that our face would reflect that joy. So Nehemiah found strength in God to rebuild the wall while facing opposition throughout this whole process. And, and Nehemiah is not very, a long book, but it's... Uh, it's very important because it shows us that even in opposition, we can still continue to do the Lord's work and pray and know that God is going to help us in what he has given us, the task he gives us to do. So like I said earlier, we're going to be in uh, chapter 6 today. So Nehemiah and the Israelites, they have finished repairing the breaches the, and the walls around Jerusalem, but the gates had not yet been installed. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah had been given this assignment from God, but Sanballat and Tobiah, they were, of course, enemies of the Jews, were hindering the progress of this build, rebuilding the wall all throughout the process. Others will oppose your efforts to obey God and follow him, but we know our true enemy is the same true enemy Nehemiah faced in this time, which is Satan, the enemy of our souls. Now, Sometimes he uses people, but remember that it tells us, the, uh, the Bible tells us that we're not fighting against, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and rulers uh, in, in the darkened world. And we have to remember that because a lot of times we want to lash out at people who we feel are opposing us. But we also have to realize why are they opposing us? Not necessarily because they want to be belligerent, you know, but because they're allowing the enemy to kind of use them. So Nehemiah prayed throughout his whole time uh, leading this effort to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And when we are, uh, when we are, 
you know, attacked by the enemy and just constantly bombarded by him, we can follow Nehemiah's example uh, of how he called on God for his strength. So we're going to be looking at verses uh, 6 through uh, 16 throughout uh, these next few uh, moments. You know, like we said, Nehemiah turned to God all throughout this effort to rebuild the damaged walls around Jerusalem. And when we say yes, when God, you know, lays an assignment or a task or, or gives us a, a, a job to do, and we say yes, no matter how, what size it is, okay? Sometimes you think, oh, well, a big task is going to have a lot of attack. This small little task, you know, maybe just um, filling envelopes in the pews, uh, or the, the little connect cards, put them in, in the pew. That's not nothing. That's not going to meet with opposition. But it doesn't matter the size of the task. The enemy will try to prevent you from being obedient and be successful in doing what God has asked you to do. And so uh, we need to be more like Nehemiah and continually seek God for help. I often find that, that you know, hey, if things are going well, then I'll just keep rolling along and, and I'm okay. But eventually you're going to hit that bump in the road and then you're going to have to backtrack uh, with your relationship with God because you haven't been relying on him for strength, relying on him for guidance and wisdom. And we have to. It's a daily walk. We often refer to it as a journey. I'm on a journey. Now, um, when we go on a journey or you go on a journey or road trip or whatever you want to call it, you've got to make preparation. You've got to pack. You've got to make sure you close down and turn off things in the house before you go. Make sure the car has been gassed up, oil changed, tires rotated, all of those things so it's road worthy. And yet we think that we can live day to day on a journey from earth to glory and we don't need to get ready or prepared for anything. We roll along until we have a bump in the road, and that's not how God designed it to be. We should always be making sure our spiritual being is road-worthy for the day and the task and the, and the obstacles that are going to come at us each and every day. So there are three things we should ask God for during uh, not just during times of enemy attack, but during our whole journey, our walk with him. One is the strength to work. Um, in Nehemiah 6, 1-4, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished the rebuild, rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. Oftentimes we don't even realize the enemy is plotting to harm us, but we need to be made more aware and have discernment. And so he said, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in great in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? And Verse 4, four times they sent the message, and each time Nehemiah gave the same reply. Why should I stop the work of the Lord and come and meet with you? You know, he knew they were plotting. We need God's strength to work diligently while resisting the enemy's schemes and distractions. This would be a distraction, and we know he knew that they meant nothing but harm, for maybe harm him or harm for the work or whatever. So God provide strength and discernment to resist the enemy's persistent invitation to, uh, you know, I, I say persistent invitation to sin, and I don't necessarily mean uh, what you might be interpreting that as, like, oh my goodness, what do you mean an invitation to sin? Well, an invitation to be distracted, an invitation to get off course, an invitation to be disobedient to what God's asked you to do and distracted from his work. You see, it's not like you get this great, beautiful envelope in the mail and, and it's addressed very nice, maybe in gold lettering to you and you open it up and it's an invitation. It's not like that. But it's just subtle things that the enemy does and thoughts that he brings across your mind, things he brings across your screens that you look at, and that plants that plants an initial, if you dwell on it, plants an initial uh, thing in your heart 
to start leading in that direction. And that is leading you to sin. The second thing, not only strength to work, but the second thing is strength to stand. In verses 5 to 7 in Nehemiah 6, the fifth time, remember they sent him that invitation four times. The fifth time, Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true. Okay, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king, a meaning king of Persia. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. So now they're kind of doing an intimidation tactic. Um, and they're actually making false accusations. You know, we need God's strength to stand against all opposition from whether it's within or whether it's without. Sometimes it's within our own family. Sometimes it's outside. Sometimes you might face opposition within uh, your, your, where you go to church or whatever. You might think, wow, why is there so much opposition here? And again, it's no, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against those principalities and the rulers uh, uh, in, of darkness that the enemy will use whatever tactic he can. You know, Nehemiah here was falsely accused. The enemy will try to entice you. He will distract you from being obedient and he'll try to impact and discourage you even through false accusation. Um, and how did Nehemiah handle this, though? I mean, because the pressure was getting more intense because now it's like, oh, you're doing this to rebel, and we're going to run and tell the king of Persia. And then, of course, he's going to come and attack and tear down these walls that you've rebuilt. Now, the word doesn't say that, but I uh, kind of gather that that's probably what they had in mind. You know, so how did he handle this? He prayed, and he continued to do God's work. So often, when we're... Uh, opposition is coming against us, we'll pray, but we'll stop doing the work. Well, I might as well just stop. There's so much opposition, opposition, I just don't even know. We get to the point where we're not even sure that's what God wanted us to do in the first place. And we have to be clear that we know that we know that we know that God said to do it, then you should know there's going to be opposition and you have got to be prepared to stand, but you can't stand in your own strength. You have to stand in the power and the might of the living God. And... Uh, and pray continually. You can't just pray once and figure out that, oh, I've covered it, it's done. No, you have to pray continually. There's a verse in the Bible that says to uh, pray unceasingly. That means you don't ever stop. When you're sleeping, your, your spirit being should be praying. And when you're awake and driving down the road, you should be praying. When you're at work, you should be in a constant attitude of prayer and thanksgiving to the Lord. You just do it. It should just become automatic because that's where your strength is going to come from. So we've had strength to work, strength to stand, and, uh, and now strength to overcome. These are all things that Nehemiah had prayed for. Nehemiah continuing in verse 8. I replied, remember they had just talked about him, the opposition and, and accus false accusations. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. I happen to be uh, reading from the New Living Translation. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with eater, even greater determination. Later, I went to visit... Uh, Shemaiah, son of Deliah, uh, the grandson of uh, Metabel, and if I pronounce these wrong, it's okay, all right? You can figure it out. Who was confined to his home? He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But Nehemiah replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. 
They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sanballat have done. And remember Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. So you see, he realized, he, the Lord had given him discernment that he realized God had not spoken to this man who said, come and meet me in the temple and shut and lock the doors because your enemy is coming to kill you. Had he been gone there, he might have gotten killed because that is just how uh, deceitful the enemy is going to do and intimidating. We need God's strength to overcome intimidation. The enemy uses fear as one of his favorite weapons against us as God's followers. We may all, not always recognize his activity behind the threatening fear, but if we will just ask the Lord to quiet our hearts through the Spirit, and pray. The Holy Spirit will give us the discernment and help us to resist. What I find is we succumb to fear. We just succumb to it. Well, uh, you know, people say things like, uh, well, you know, you've never done anything like this before. How could you do it? How do you think that's going to work? How do you think those people are going to uh, receive you coming from you know, where you come from or knowing about your background. And we can't listen to that. We have to allow the Lord to tell, help us to shut our ears and shut out the, the naysayers, so to speak. There's always going to be naysayers. And uh, whether they're well-meaning people or not, if they're a naysayer and they're not encouraging you to do, as long as you know it's what God wants you to do, if they're not encouraging you, then you've got to step away from them. Because they will lead you in a path to be uh, disobedient to the task that God has assigned for you. You know, and we know a lot about intimidation and bullying and all of that. There's all kinds of that. And sometimes we always think it's the person. Sometimes people do that to make themselves look better. And in, in the end, they don't look better. Okay? We need to press closer to God and overcome every attempt of the enemy to undo us, to unravel us, so to speak, with fear. You know, um, in, in Timothy it says that we have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. The love comes from God. The power is of God. And the sound mind comes from being in his word and, and, and following his decrees and knowing. You know, at the end of the day, when you stand there in front of the mirror, it's you and God. Did you do in that day, did you do everything he asked you to do? And if you're okay with that and answering yes to that question, looking at yourself in the mirror, then you have to know that God would be okay. If you have to, and well, you have to be truthful. I guess you can lie to yourself. That's not very good. But if you stand there and say, Lord, I tried my best today. I might have failed, but I pray you'll give me more opportunities to try again and give me the strength, give me the courage to overcome, give me the strength to stand, Lord, no matter what is coming at me, and, re and take away this fear. And if you do that, then it doesn't matter what people say. They're always going to try and point a finger. I often find those pointing fingers and using those tactics aren't doing anything for the Lord themselves. And that is the shame of it all. They're more like uh, an obstacle in the way as opposed to someone encouraging people and praying for people that are doing things for God. Sometimes the enemy will use people we know. They might use your boss. They might use your family to intimidate or to throw you off of your assignment. And we have to be aware of those schemes. The enemy will try many different things to discourage you in completing what God has asked you to do. Even to the point where, well, I didn't get any response. So I guess I didn't do it right. It's not about that. We often think when we're doing something for God, if there's not the response we in our humanness think we should get, we think we failed. Do you realize that if you're doing something and you're pleading to people or you're sharing God's word with people or your story about how God brought you out of, of some terrible times and you're sharing that and they don't respond to you, that doesn't matter. If God asks you to share it, you're done. That's your assignment. 
and you did it, you're done. Them responding is not held against you. It's between them and God. And if they, they're not refusing you, they're refusing God. And we have to remember that, that if they don't respond like we think they should respond, it's not on us. We did what we were asked to do, and then it's on them. You see, and that's a, a way that we get so discouraged and so distraught. Well, I failed. I should have done this. And we beat ourselves up for days over sometimes silly things that have nothing to do even with God's work. But we do it because why? The enemy just keeps bringing in, oh, you should have, you know, that would have never happened if you would have done this. If you had just taken a few minutes to do this, what the result you got would never have happened. And stop beating yourself up because the enemy has not changed his schemes. There are always still temptation, distraction, false accusation, intimidation, and fear all the time. In the Bible, those are the same things he's used. They're the same things he used in the New Testament, then the Old Testament. And now they're the same things he's using in us through the media, the source of media that is all around us that we always think we never can shut off. And then we get to the end and we get to verse 15, though. So, in spite of all of this that's been going on, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished, just 52 days after they had begun. So you see, because Nehemiah was continually praying and asked the Lord for strength to work and strength to uh, stand and strength to overcome. They were able to finish building the wall. And Nehemiah had prayed faithfully. He worked faithfully. I think at some point, if you read in uh, past chapters, it talks about they were working with one hand and wielding a sword or wielding arrows or someone was shooting arrows while they were working at the same time on the wall. You see, they resisted the enemy's schemes. And they refuse to fall to the tactics of the enemy. And that's what we have to do. Refuse to fall to the tactics of the enemy. We need to find our strength in the Lord. Always pray without ceasing. Worship Jesus, even out loud. Come on. We're so bent on, I don't want anybody to hear me. Why? Why don't you want anybody to hear you? You're worshiping the Lord. If you're in church, you should be worshiping out loud. Aren't you thankful? Don't you want to express that thanks for what he has done for you? When you're out walking and nobody's around, why can't you be worshiping the Lord out loud? When you're working at work and no one's around you, why can't you be? Why can't you be humming Christian songs? in the workplace. You don't have to say the words. You can be humming them because it's music. You know, you can quote scripture and quote it out loud. When the enemy seems like he's coming at you, you need to start quoting the word out loud. Isn't that what Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness? He used the word of God against the enemy. He cannot come against the word of God. We draw the bloodline of Jesus. He cannot cross that bloodline. We need to press in closer to God so that victory will be ours. And I love verse 16. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, meaning the completion of the wall, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. You see, everything we do is to bring glory and honor to him, to show that he, he walks in a, with us, inside of us. We carry him wherever we go. And it's to draw people to him. When you don't yield to temptation and everyone around you does, people take note of that. When you don't uh, listen to the uh, off color, we say off color, but come on, they're just bad, bad jokes. When we don't listen to them, and we certainly don't repeat them, or we're the only ones standing there because we couldn't get out, out of the room, and we're not laughing, people take note of that. When, when there's false accusation, and you know it, that they don't have what we call a leg to stand on, and you come out the, on the other side without any kind of uh, uh, reprimand, without any kind of uh, anything coming against your um, reputation, 
People take note. And why do they need to take note? Because they will realize that all of this was done. You had the help of God on your side. The help of God that strengthened you to work continually in, in uh, not good conditions, not a, a hostile work environment. You know, the strength of God to stand even when false accusations were made. The strength of God to overcome and to carry on no matter what was coming your way. That will show people that God is God and something in you is different and it's got to be God because humans couldn't do those things without the help of God. You see, the Lord will provide all you need to complete the assignments that he gives you when you rely, praying always, worshiping always, quoting scripture always, and pressing in closer to God. Father, I pray for those listening today that you would touch their lives, that if they are, if opposition is coming their way or if they have succumbed to, to uh, temptation, that, Lord, all is not lost. They can come and say, I am sorry, forgive me, help me to get back on track. And Lord, then they have to do the things to get back on track. They have to get back in your word. They need to get back in fellowship with you, but with a body of believers because one person alone fighting a battle needs help. And they can be encouraged by bodies of believers around them if they will just get connected again, Lord. And I thank you that you will give them strength to stand. You will give them strength to do the work. You will give them strength to overcome. And Lord, if they've taken on tasks that you did not assign them to do, then you help them to realize that they shouldn't be doing that. And then help them to know when you speak that it's a task you're giving them to do and that they need to obey and they need to be diligent with that work. And I thank you. Lord, if there's one listening that needs healing, that you would bring healing to them. Lord, maybe through a process in their journey or their walk with you, they've been hurt. They've been hurt by people that should have been leading them in a right direction, but caused them harm in, in some way and hurt and pain and maybe made false accusations against them, maybe were a distraction, maybe led them in a direction they should have never gone. And maybe they were just not kind to them. Lord, maybe they were... Uh, built in intimidation in, to them and maybe they were kind of what we call bullying today and maybe they brought on fear. Lord, first of all, I pray that you would release that pain, that they would open up that wound and allow you to heal every part and get all the infection and all of that out of that unhealed wound and bring peace. And then Lord, when that is healed, pour in your peace, your love, your mercy and your grace and then help them to extend forgiveness to the one or to those who hurt them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. If you are enjoying our online, then try coming and visiting us in person. I guarantee you that the it'll be the same sermon, but it will be different. It always turns out different. But God bless you. We love you. And if you have a prayer request, you can put it, uh, send it to the email on the bottom of your screen. And we hope to see you, if not in person here, we hope to see you in person in heaven. God bless you.